We're just talking in the last segment about how regulation of short-term rentals has fallen way behind the technology. We've seen this in ride-hailing companies and the like. The tech comes in, or scooters, for example, the rental scooters, and cities and counties scramble to try and keep up. When we talk about the vastness of the open seas, that's probably an impossible level of oversight for governments to have, but as is detailed in Ian Urbina's brand new book, The Outlaw Ocean, there's certainly much more that countries could do to try and deal with everything from toxic waste dumping to the enslavement of people who were used as as laborers on the open seas, overfishing that occurs off so many countries, all those things that are tremendous threats to the future. Ian Urbina's book, The Outlaw Ocean, journeys across the last untamed frontier, developed out of a series of stories for the New York Times. He's a Polk Award-winning journalist um, for his work. Ian, it's good to have you with us to talk about the book. Thanks for having me. The The range of stories that you tell here and the individuals you profile is pretty astounding. Uh, how many years total of work and, and different types of vessels factor into this? Mm. So this took about five years to report. Uh, as you said, it started in the New York Times, and then I took some time away from the paper to work on the book. Um, and uh, I took a photographer with me, and we visited every continent, both poles, the North and South Pole, and and every ocean um, in the course of sort of telling these stories. How did you get people to agree to allow you to take these vessels, like, you know, fishing boat, commercial fishing and the like. Um, What led them to uh, play ball with you? Yeah, I mean, uh, time, you know, and sort of transparency. Um, uh, The toughest stories were the ones about forced labor on these ships and sea slavery, as it's called, uh, and getting captains to take us on usually meant um, developing a relationship with them. So in the case of that story, we went to one uh, port, city in Thailand in particular called Songkla and um, spent weeks uh, essentially courting um, fishing boat captains trying to convince them to take us on board and ultimately just told them that we want to document um, their work, their world, their lives. Um, uh, You know, most of us land lovers don't know what they do and um, ultimately we found several that were willing to take us on. The the variety, as I mentioned, is so great in the types of ships and the kind of work that's being done at sea, but is there is there an overarching culture of the ocean that you encountered, mm. or is is that hard to put one's finger on? I think there really is. I mean, I, I was an anthropo- cultural anthropologist before becoming a journalist, and, and in many ways what attracted me to this topic was the anthropology of it all, sort of um, seafarers or fishers, um, people that work on fishing boats are in many ways a tribe, sort of a diaspora, transient, global tribe that is invisible to most of us. There are 50 million of these mostly men working at sea. Um, and I, I do think there's definitely a culture in the sense that um, it attracts people that um, uh, A, want to get away from sort of rules and government and have a different lifestyle. Um, it also, um, there's a real hi- hierarchy on the ships that's, I think, akin to the military. Um, and um, things like uh when you're allowed to speak, uh, in the company of whom, uh, in what parts of the ship certain people are allowed to speak. These are all sort of subtle cultural elements on the ship. Um, There's there's a real code of discipline uh, and real violence that happens on these ships um, if people break the rules. Uh, So I I definitely think there's a real culture. How did you learn these rules? Because I'm sure you don't step on board and they hand you a card that's got them. So how do you discern them? I had spent some time uh, when I was working as an anthropologist on some ships, and so I had initial exposure in that capacity. But really, I learned it through the reporting um, and and just abiding by a couple of basic rules. One, be quiet, you know, and um, be respectful. Uh, you're always an immigrant, um, sort of a, an outsider to their world, and as such, um, you should sort of have a small presence. And If you follow that rule, in most cases, you can take in a lot more. And just by, you know, months and months spent at sea with these uh, folk, um, I picked them up. But truth be told, I I still, I just was on a ship near the Gambia about a month and a half ago and um, was still shocked at how much I don't know. Wow. So it's sort of every ship 
uh, or every type of work has its own uh, lessons to teach. Being quiet has to be difficult for a reporter because the job is asking questions. So then that puts a lot of weight. When you break the silence and you ask a question because you really need to know something that you're witnessing, what the details are, um, you got to choose those questions very carefully. Yeah, I mean, that is true. At the same time, uh, the nature of stepping on a vessel uh, and this reporting is one in which um, you're going to be there for a while you know, because you're probably traveling a long distance. And so knowing not to rush things and not to ask questions sometimes for days and just to sort of be present and do work and um, keep your eyes open, but not to try to engage folks until um, uh, you've given them um, the exposure they need to you to see that you're respectful. Ian, I detail for us how these incidents of forced labor occur and how men get handed off from one party to another and and how they end up in this circumstance. So so sea slavery, as it's often called, occurs um, in fishing, long-haul fishing fleets around the world. So it's not just on the South China Sea near Thailand, which is a place that's gotten a lot of attention. You can find it off the coast of West Africa, off the coast of the Falkland Islands, off the coast of New Zealand. I looked at it as it played out on the South China Sea. So that's those are the waters near Myanmar, Laos, Cambodia, Vietnam, Thailand. And the Thai fleet in particular has a real problem with it. And in that case, you have a country, Thailand, that's largely middle class, uh, less than 2% unemployment. Most Thais do not take the worst jobs. So the women are not in the sex work industry, and largely um, those are import um, women, uh, migrant, often undocumented um, women and girls. And in on the fishing boats, same thing. The men, Thai men, are not usually, maybe they're officers, but uh, deckhands rarely are um, Thai. Those jobs are worked by um, Burmese, Cambodian, Vietnamese, Laotian. And those are countries that are desperately poor, um, very violent situations there. And that desperation causes a lot of these migrants to essentially um, uh sort of get an offer from a labor broker, as they're called, human trafficker, who brings them across the border into the country, usually on the pretext that they're um, aimed at a, a job in construction, and it sounds really attractive. It's on land. It's good paying. They're probably not destined for construction. They're headed to the ports. And um, these men and boys are brought in illegally into the country, brought to the ports, and then the debt that was incurred um, through that transport uh, is a sort of um, uh, commodity that, that gets sold to the captain. The captain pays off the labor broker the 500 bucks it costs to bring that guy there. And now that captain essentially owns that young man. And um, that's debt bondage. You know, it's um, And you have tens of thousands of men and boys. I met some and interviewed some as young as 13 on these boats who end up on the ships that way. And their only hope of getting off is, is when they land in a port where they can get off the ship yeah and and even um even that can be dodgy because uh the captains uh, often have armed guards who watch them um and ensure that those men don't leave and if they try to escape there are, there's a whole sort of grid of bounty hunters that go looking for them for so that. they can be held for years potentially paying off this this uh, supposed debt that's right yeah i mean um one of the initial stories we ran was uh, an even worse form of trafficking, which entailed a, um, a man who was who attempted to uh, la- named Lang Long, who attempted to flee his boat um, while he was at sea, tried to jump overboard and swim to another ship that was nearby. He was caught, brought back to the boat, and for the rest of the two years he was working on that boat, he was shackled by the neck um, when he wasn't uh, hauling nets. So um, this is really modern day slavery must have been quite a challenge to get him to tell you his story. It was. In, in Lang Long's case, he had been rescued from this situation after three years in captivity on multiple boats. He was sold boat to boat, um, and it, he was a very damaged um, human being. So that was a very sensitive process. It took weeks to get him to feel comfortable to talk about what happened. We'll continue our conversation with Ian Urbina, author of The Outlaw Ocean Journeys Across the Last Untamed Frontier. About five years of seagoing on his part to tell these stories from around the world 
all the different uh, industries out on the high sea, different types of ships, um, different uh, registries for those ships, and uh, the variety of people who make their living uh, forced uh, or of their own free will on the sea. We'll continue our conversation in one minute on Air Talk. Ian, we uh, have a listener who wonders whether there's any non-slavery shrimping these days. Do you know? Yeah, so a fair amount of the shrimp that is consumed in the West comes from um, land farms. So, uh, And those have real problems in the peeling sheds. So when the shrimps, there are environmental problems uh, in the aquatic farms antibiotics and runoff and these sorts of things waste and yeah, yeah. Um, but the 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 concerns about those workers tends to come in the peeling sheds um, so when the shrimps are pulled out they're prepared for market and uh, those often use child and debt bonded so labor. that's all done by hand yeah wow yeah, at least in thailand Wow. The Outlaw Ocean Journeys Across the Last Untamed Frontier. Our guest is Ian Urbina, who writes for the New York Times, wrote a series uh, several years ago about his time out on the ocean, a variety of different environments, then went back after the series ran, two more years of research and interviews and experiences, and uh, that's entailed in the new book, The Outlaw Ocean. One of the fascinating parts of it is that you've got repo men out on the ocean, um, and not repossessing just a little boat, but huge vessels. How do they do their work? Yeah, so it's, it's uh, I mean, testament to the outlaw ocean is just the diversity of characters you find out there. And, and one niche industry or um, much like cars, you know, um, ships have mortgages, you know, and there's money invested in them from various lenders often. And so there are, you know, a half dozen to a dozen, mostly men who specialize in um, going to foreign ports and uh, either talking to the relevant players and trying to convince them to hand over their ship. And if that doesn't work, then they surreptitiously board the ship, usually with a small crew. They hotwire the thing and they <laughs> sort of they, they pull it out. And so I went to, I went on two repos with um, one such kind of the the grandfather of this industry is a guy named Max Hardberger, and um, I went with him as he did this very thing and took the ship. And what's different from a car is that when you get to the thirteen mile mark, you're on. In, in international waters. So suddenly, jurisdictionally, you're in the clear if you can just get the ship beyond that 12-mile mark. So it's a really fascinating scene. In fact, that could be an alternate title for the book, right, beyond the 12-mile mark, because right. that's where all this stuff right. takes place, where there's just no one has jurisdiction. That's right. Yeah, no, it's that space that belongs to everyone and no one, and for which there really isn't a police force that is, you know, enforcing what few rules do exist. I, I do, though, picture, just like with car repossessions, the captain running out to the end of the pier as the ship is going it's, going off. Was it like that? It was, yeah, actually. You know, it's usually the Coast Guard, um, you know, who gets called, and the question is whether they can raise the, coast, the local Coast Guard quickly enough. I went to Haiti and then to Greece, uh, and can they, can the repo man get far enough out that the Coast Guard can't catch up with them uh, is usually the big question. Well, and if repo men can do this, then couldn't thieves take ships the same way? Yeah, and they do, and they do. You know, there are parts, there are places in the world where where ships are stolen. I mean, um, the thing that's also distinct, I think, about the maritime space is that it's really much simpler to, to even though it's a huge, you know, piece of machinery, a ship, um, Changing its identity is much easier um, because of flag registries, because of the ownership structure within maritime are usually P.O. box companies and other countries. And um, you can, um, while you're en route from one port to another, um, completely wash the identity of a ship. Worth millions of dollars. That's right. And sometimes tens of millions of cargo on board. Wow. Um, and what's amazing, too, is these days, what a small crew, those ships. You, how, how many people are typically on those large container ships? Yeah, a Maersk ship, a Maersk ship like a container ship, might have um, 10 men uh, or, or, or women on board, and that's it. And those are masses or football field size vessels. And are there very many women who are working on, on the ocean? No, it's, it's uh, less than 1%, and it's a pretty striking 
absence that's been that way for 20 years, despite efforts to recruit women. You write about how violent it can be as well with sort of, uh, you know, law enforcement um, done on the spot, uh, including people killed. And is that just because there's no recourse? Yeah, I think there are a couple of factors. I mean, w- one story we looked at was a, a murder that occurred. Um, it was filmed on a cell phone camera. Um, that cell phone camera was left in the back of a taxi in Fiji. Um, I was alerted to it by a source at Interpol. And the, the film shows um, five to six men being summarily killed. They're in the water. And, and um, at the end, the most shocking thing is at the end of the video, either the witnesses or the culprits, it's unclear who, but someone at the scene, a bunch of guys at the scene, posed for celebratory selfies. And so we spent a year investigating, investigating this case, figuring out who the shooters were, who the guys in the water were, what ships those were. And um, even once this evidence was brought forward, you know, on the front page of the New York Times, no country was willing to prosecute. And that's, I think, partially because, number one, the crimes occur on the high seas. So jurisdictionally, it's tough to figure out whose job it is. And number two, the victims are often from developing nations um, and often migrant and undocumented. So they're sort of triply invisible. Um, And number three, the very nature of these ships are... um, you know, you've got one, you've got a captain from one country, officers from a second country, the ship is owned by someone in a third country, the cargo is en route to a fourth country, the crew are from a fifth country, and the the insurer is in a sixth country. So who it is that would actually pay for the investigator to bring that crime forward and where they would try to prosecute it is tough. So literally, when someone goes to work on one of these these ships, particular long hauling, you are kind of taking the life in your hands. I mean, I was thinking of all the sort of natural, you know, threats that you'd fall overboard or be hit by hit by some sort of a, you know, large piece of metal or some all those things that I know are real risk, but that you'd get killed by a crew member um, and there'd be no uh, recourse. Yeah, I think I think your instinct is right, right? So the, the, the most dangerous thing are the conditions on the vessels. And, and again, to be clear, we're not talking about Maersk shipping container vessels. We're largely talking about um, developing nation fishing vessels, uh, of which there are tens of thousands. Um, but those are really dangerous for the conditions on board. And then secondarily dangerous for um, uh, the, the officers and the violence that can occur there. And um, again... A lot of men do this work, come back paid and, you know, safe and sound. But when things do go wrong, there's rarely any justice brought to bear. So many uh, other important accounts that are included in the outlaw ocean, uh, overfishing, uh, the dumping of polluted uh, liquids into the waters. Um, also, of course, uh, just the issue of what it's like for someone to be aboard this ship extended period of time with a lot of other guys in close quarters. You get very vivid descriptions of that. I feel like I could smell it after (laughs) after reading it. Ian, thank you so much. Remarkable investigative work. I appreciate it. Thank you. He's the winner of the Pulitzer Prize for Breaking News, uh, George Polk Award for his foreign reporting as well. And uh, he covers it all in the Outlaw Ocean Journeys Across the Last Untamed Frontier. For all of us at Air Talk, have a terrific afternoon. Fresh air with Terry Gross, her guest, journalist Ronan Farrell, is next.